Well, good evening. I want you to go ahead and make your way to Luke chapter 15 tonight. Um, our passage of Scripture that we're going to look at in just a moment is going to be in the book of Hebrews. We're, we, we're going to look there in Hebrews chapter 4, but go ahead and make your way to Luke chapter 15 and just want to touch on a little bit of what we talked about last week. Um, we began looking at the ministry of Christ and specifically uh, we were talking about His ministry and suffering. And, and our goal in this study is not just to look at the passages that deal with the suffering of Christ, but really to discover um, the heart of Christ in His suffering. And so, as a result of His suffering, what does that mean for us? Uh, how, how do we, we know that we have a, a suffering Savior, but how does that apply to us, and what are we to think about that in terms of our relationship to Him now? And so, we're going to uh, go back to Hebrews in a moment, but last time we were together, we looked at Hebrews chapter 12, and if you recall, uh, we spent time talking about that Christ, looking at Hebrews 12 too, that He suffered and endured the cross for the joy that was set before Him. And we talked about that joy. We don't often think of our Savior in that way. When we think about the cross, uh, too often times we, we think about the cross in terms of something that was necessary for him to do. He had to do this um, to make atonement for his people. And that is true. It was a necessity that Christ needed to go to, uh, that he went to the cross. It was necessary for him to do this to be a substitutionary atonement on behalf of his people. But I don't know that we spend as much time do we really think about this in the sense that he endured all of that that suffering, um, the agony in the garden, the arrest, uh, the humiliation, the, the scourging, the rejection, that all of this, the writer of Hebrew tells us that he endured that, despising the shame of the cross for the joy that was set before him. And so our Savior, there was a joy that was set before him. And as we emphasized last time, that joy is the forgiveness of his people is the reconciliation of his people. And that's tied in that passage of Scripture. It makes it very clear that the joy is him redeeming a people for himself, us being reconciled to God. And so this idea of joy, and that's where I wanted to look at Luke chapter 15 just for a moment as we think about our Savior, and we think about repenting of our sins and being reconciled to God, to him seeking us out. You see this in Luke chapter 15, this idea of joy. And so this is not just in the book of Hebrews, but it's throughout the Scriptures. We won't take the time to read through all of this, but I just want to highlight a couple of times that we see. You know these three stories that are recorded here that Jesus tells in Luke chapter 15. But in verse number 7, where he talks about the lost uh, sheep, he says, I tell, you, I tell you that in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. You see the joy that is mentioned there, the joy in the lost coin. You see in verse number 10, uh, this woman who scrounges and searches for this uh, lost coin finds it. And verse 10 says, in the same way, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And then, of course, in the prodigal son, you see that joy as well. It doesn't, we don't find the word joy. We do find the word rejoice at the end of this story. But certainly you see the joy over the prodigal son returning as the father runs out to meet him. And you recall that the story in which the prodigal son returns, the, the older, the other son who was there was, was somewhat dismayed and indignant by the way that the father had behaved. And, and he tells us at the end of Luke 15, verses 31 and 32, that the father gives an explanation. He said to him, son, you have always been with me, and all that is mine is yours, but we had to celebrate and rejoice 
For this brother of yours was dead and has begun to live and was lost and has been found. Joy. So when we think about our Savior, I, I think it's important that as we think about the Lord Jesus Christ, that we don't, we don't think about it in terms of duty and a necessity, but we think about it in terms of love, and we think about Him in terms of this joy. Our Lord loved us so much that He endured the cross, and He has great joy in forgiveness of our sins and reconciling us to God the Father. Again, it's the joy that we see in this Luke 15 that I don't know that we really grasp when we, talk, when we think about the Lord Jesus. I, I was sharing a little bit about um, Dane Ortland, who is a pastor who gave an example to kind of highlight this point. He, he talked about a, a, uh, a compassionate doctor who had traveled to uh, the deep parts of the jungle and he was wanting to provide medical care to a primitive tribe that was afflicted with a contagious disease. And uh, he had his medical equipment flown in. He uh, had correctly diagnosed the problem, and uh, the antibiotics were prepared and were available. He was independently wealthy, so he didn't really need anything, uh, any kind of financial compensation. But as he sought to provide care, the afflicted refused. They wanted to take care of themselves. Uh, they wanted to heal on their own terms. And finally, a, a few brave young men stepped forward to receive the care that was freely provided for them. And the question that he poses is, what did the doctor feel when they did that? And it was joy. Because he, he had come to heal them. How, how much more for the family of God? I mean, this, when we think about the Lord Jesus and we think about joy, it's not, it's not just something that describes our Lord. It is, it, it is our Lord. He is joyful. He is full of joy. This is who He is. He is our Savior. He wants to heal us. He wants to reconcile us. He wants to restore us. And what we emphasized last time, and mentioned one of the quotes by Thomas Goodwin, one of the Puritans, is that this is ongoing. And so, and so when we think about the Lord Jesus as our Savior, and as tonight we're going to look at as our high priest, that we should be mindful that he has joy when we come to him. This is who he is. He is the healer. He is our high priest. He is our savior. Well, let's look at Hebrews chapter 4 tonight. Just a, a couple of verses that I want to highlight for us and we'll expound upon some of the truth that is here in Hebrews 4, verses 14 through 16. But the writer of Hebrews begins with, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. And therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And this is the word of our Lord. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, even as we sing tonight, we thank you for the Lord Jesus. We thank you for the blood of Christ. We thank you that we have a compassionate and sympathetic and loving high priest 
that we can come to you through him and that we can have confidence, Lord, that you hear our prayers because of him. And Lord, that you desire to forgive us and to cleanse us and to grant us mercy and grace in our time of need. Lord, thank you for Jesus. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. Well, the book of Hebrews, as we've talked about last week a little bit, we're looking at this section. We're just kind of pulling out some scriptures. This is one of my favorite passages of scripture. I love this particular passage, and I cannot expound upon everything that is here. Really, I want to focus in on verse 15, but I, but I had us to go back to verse 14 to put all this together. But I want you to see that as you read this particular passage of Scripture, that the first thing that you're struck with there in verse number 14 is that Jesus is called a great high priest. He's not just a high priest, but he's a a great high priest. And, And namely, because as it said, he has passed through the heavens. As the book tells us, he has entered into the holy of holies. Not not the mere copy or the replica, the tabernacle, the temple that was meant to be a copy of what is in heaven, but he went into the very holy of holies, a place that was not made with hands, but the heavenlies. There's something else that I want you to notice in that verse number 14, and it refers to him as Jesus, the Son of God. And don't miss that. I I think as we read that, too often times we've kind of been trained this way in our thinking that we see the Son of God and automatically we assume that he's talking about the deity of Christ. But that's not what he's talking about. It's not the deity of Christ, but rather the Son of God is a title that was given to the King of Israel. That's really very clear in chapter 1 when you begin to see as chapter 1 makes reference to Psalm 2 and, and, and really the... The, you think about the, the um, everlasting kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ who it comes through the Davidic promise, that Davidic covenant that God makes with David that he's going to have a son that will have this everlasting kingdom. But the Son of God is a title that was used of the King of Israel. We've talked about this extensively. In Romans chapter 1, where we're, he's declared the Son of God in power. Um, book of Revelation, we see, again, speaking of the Son of God. In other words, going back to the history and how God dealt with Israel, when you look at Israel's history, you see that the priest was the representative of the people to God, and that the king was the representative of God to the people. And so Jesus is our high priest. He is our king. He's the priest. He's the king priest or priest king. I got all this in my mind and I can't get it out fast enough. Last, last week we emphasized that when Jesus uh, had completed that work as the high priest that he sits down at the right hand of the Father. And that's true. I mean, it, certainly that signifies that, he has, that he's completed, he's finished that work of atonement. It is, it is completed. And so he's sitting there, as contrasted to the priests who were always standing and ministering, it is finished, it is completed. But it also signifies that he is a king who is ruling and reigning. He sits at the right hand of the Father. And so as we think about verse 14, this great high priest, we have this representative. He's both high priest and king. We're to hold fast to this confession. And then he ties verse 15 to that. It's almost as if uh, the writer of Hebrews is anticipating that when you think about the high priestly king, that this, this king who is in heaven, he's passed through, that he cannot sympathize with us. I mean, he's, he's there, and so how can he sympathize with us? And it's like he wants to reassure us that this one can sympathize with us. 
And so he gives this thought. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. And so it's interesting how he words this, that we have a high priest who can sympathize if you put it in the positive. He puts it in a negative and then a positive. But as we think about this, that this one can sympathize with us. We think about Jesus, I think for some people, as they think about their relationship with the Lord and they think about the Lord Jesus Christ, they think, well, I know that he's for me. As long as I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing, I know that God is for me. I know that Jesus is with me. But this verse says just the opposite. It says in our weakness that he sympathizes with us. And that word sympathy, or sympathize as it's translated, is two compound words, and I won't get into all the Greek because it's, it's all Greek to me too. But, but, but to say this, that these, these two words really, really means to, it, it's, it's where we would think of co, but it's, it's with and to suffer. And the idea of what he's saying here is that in our weaknesses, that he suffers with us. That he comes along beside us. That, that he enters into that. And, and, and we don't have a, a comprehension of this. I, I was trying to think about how, how could we relate to this when we think about uh, a high priest who is sympathetic. And, and, and I don't want you to see it as a detached pity. You know, that he, that he has pity on us. But rather he, he feels our pain. The best, and it falls short, but probably the best analogy that we have is that of a, a parent and a child. And as you think about a child who is suffering or going through difficulties, and I, I think many of us parents can relate to this, that when they hurt, we hurt. But it's so much greater than that. Because our high priest knows us better than we know ourselves. As much as a parent can know a child, they don't know the, all the intricacies of their mind and their heart, but the Lord Jesus knows all. I mean, He knows us better than anyone knows us. No one knows us like Jesus knows us. And this is what He's emphasizing is that this high priest, who, this, this king, this one who is in the heavenlies, when we're in our weakness, when we're suffering, when we're going through difficulty, he enters into that suffering with us. It's not that he's experiencing it himself, but he is so acutely aware of what we're going through that he's able to sympathize and have compassion on us during those times. This is how he describes him. When we think about the Lord Jesus and we think about the different things that he experienced in his life and we think about our own personal life and some of the difficulties that we have, whether it be being abandoned or feeling isolated or being rejected, well, he knows all of that. In fact, as you think about the Lord Jesus Christ, there is nothing that we go through that he himself has not gone through. I was thinking of an objection here. Somebody raises the question, well, well what about wasting time watching a bunch of YouTube videos all day long? I mean, he doesn't know anything about that. But he does know about the temptation to waste time. He does know about the temptation to be out of the will of God. You can apply it in different ways, but the point is, is that everything that we go through, every kind of difficulty, and I'm getting into the sin part, and I really just want to focus just for a moment on the suffering part, that when you think about the Lord Jesus and the suffering, at his greatest hour of need, every close friend that he had abandoned him. When you think about all that he's gone through and 
suffering and all that he's gone through and the scourging and the hatred, uh, being despised, uh, everything. There's nothing that we can go through that he cannot sympathize with. With. I mean, he, he is able to enter into that with us. Which brings on the subject of sin. Well, what about sin? I mean, can he sympathize with us in our sin? That's his point. In our weakness. See, see here's the thing about the Lord Jesus as we think about him. He can sympathize. Look how it's worded. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. What he's emphasizing is, is that in our weakness, to include sin when we're in those moments of weaknesses, he can sympathize with the temptations, he can sympathize with the weightiness of sin, and yet... He himself, having felt all of that weight, did not sin. Put it in a different way. When we give in to temptation and when we do sin, we don't know the full weight of that because we give in to it. Christ is like that rock beside the ocean that the the waves of temptation keep crashing and crashing and crashing, and there he is, solid, without moving. And all of this temptation, all of this sin uh, washes over him, but he he never gives into it. He is that solid rock who is steadfast and firm. And when we're weak, he knows something about the weightiness of the sin that we're dealing with. And what's different from him than every other high priest is he doesn't have to go make atonement for his own sin because he's sinless. And so not only can he sympathize with us, but he can do something about our sin. He can give us forgiveness. He can give us grace and he can give us mercy. That's what he does. That's what it says here. He's been... Tempted in all things as we are, and yet without sin. He's already said this before. Go go back to chapter 2. He says it in a different way. Chapter 2, verse number 17. He's talking about the humility of Christ, His incarnation. Therefore, verse 17, He had to be made like His brethren in all things, so that He might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered, look at that last phrase, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. One of the things we glean from that Yes, He offers forgiveness. Yes, there is joy that is in forgiving us and reconciling us of our sin. But don't miss what He's telling us in there. When the temptation comes, He's saying that there's help that we can have. There's one who can come to our aid in the midst of our temptation. There's one who can meet our needs, who can give us the, the, grant us the, the grace to be able to stand firm and to be able to sustain us through those temptations that come. This is what he's telling. What he's telling us is run, flee, come to Christ. You think about when you see Adam in the Old Testament, he, when, when, when God comes into the garden after he sinned, he, he runs away. And what the writer of Hebrews is telling us is that we should be running to him, not away from him. Why? Because he's our high priest. He's able to help us in our time of need. Go back to chapter 4 and let's finish out this by looking at verse 16. Therefore, it's because of all of this. 
Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence. That, that word confidence, you recognize it? We looked at it just a few weeks ago when we were looking at Ephesians and we were talking about entering into the throne room of grace. We talked about being able to pray that we, that we have this confidence. Remember what illustration we used of the confidence? That, that confidence is something that is gained like, like riding a bicycle. Y'all remember this? Y'all, y'all should nod your heads. Yeah, I, Pastor, I remember everything you said. I, yeah. that, that riding a bike, you remember the first time you rode a bike? Not much confidence. But as you got back on it and you rode it and you rode it and you rode it, eventually there was confidence. Let us draw near with confidence. The confidence that we have that He will grant us mercy and grace in our time of need comes through continually seeking Him for that grace and that mercy. He's done it before. I'm confident that He's going to do it again. You see, one of the reasons that we don't have confidence in coming to the Lord is because, quite frankly, we don't come to the Lord. Why don't we come to Him? Because we really don't know Him. Because the more we know Him, the more confidence that we will have that He will do just what the Scripture says that He will do. He will help us in our time of need. His throne that the King Jesus rules and reigns from is a throne of grace. And with joy, He forgives us and restores us in fellowship. The question I have for you tonight is, are you struggling? Are you struggling? Are, are, are you hurting? Are you suffering? Are you going through a difficult time? Know this, that He can sympathize with you and that He enters into that sympathy with you. And know this with confidence that if you will come and you will seek and you will ask, He will answer, and you will receive the grace and mercy in your time of need. Father, we are grateful for the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, that He is a sympathetic and compassionate high priest. And Lord, help us to learn of Him to come along beside him and know that his yoke is easy. Help us, Lord, to to know the Lord Jesus. Help us, Lord, to be a people that are not led by the flesh, but are led by the Spirit, a people who by faith seek you and know that in our time of need that we can find mercy and grace. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.